Hi, I'm Laura of Strawberry Moon Farm in Franklin, Indiana, and USA, and this is my design project for the Permaculture Women's Guild. I began my career as a software engineer, and I worked in that field for 14 years um, while I prepared to make the leap into full-time farming. Most of the work you'll see in this presentation was completed in evenings and weekends. Beginning one year ago, I was finally able to begin working with the land full time, which has been one of the most amazing blessings of my life. I farm 10 acres in Midwest USA, and I specialize in native food and medicine plants. I also write about this work on my blog, strawberrymoonfarm.com. My goal for this land is to restore abundance and biodiversity while also producing good food at the same time, and to help make it possible for others to do the same by sharing experiential knowledge gained by building a working model of regenerative bioregional agriculture. This will be a lifelong project and will maintain and expand the existing woodlands, adding acres of native plant food forests, incorporating animals as partners in land management, and building habitat for wildlife, pollinators, and other beneficial insects. There will also be a market garden where tomatoes, cabbages, and other familiar favorites will be grown. This project includes the 10 acres in, of land inside the pink boundary. The land is surrounded on two sides by commodity crops grown in the no-till method, and the other two sides are surrounded by wooded riparian areas, although the side across the street is very newly planted wooded riparian areas, so um, it, it's still um, very young. Due to the diverse topography of the site, zones have been chosen according to their microclimates more than due to their locations. Zone one was originally a combination of backyard and farm field. It currently includes the market garden and the movable chicken coops. Zone two was originally a farm field and it includes uh, or will include native herbs, berries, and grapevines. The honeybee hives are also here and hopefully one day it will also include sheep. Zone three was originally farm fields um, and is currently being, being converted to native plant food forests. Zone four has been and will remain wooded. The most dominant sectors on this site are water and herbicide drift. Part of the land is a floodplain, and so water is foremost in my mind most of the time. Since the land surrounded, is surrounded on two sides by industrial agriculture, herbicide drift is also a significant shaper of the land. I have failed to grow anything within 20 to 30 feet of those fields, except in the area near the house where existing trees and shrubs block the drift. I have not been able to establish any new trees in this drift zone. Existing resources are many and it includes a well and septic system for the house, a solar energy system, which also powers the whole house, some food and tool storage, learning and business space, relaxing and meditation space, food preparation space, seed starting and microgreen space. And a lot of these spaces uh, overlap and are in the same multi-purpose areas. Zone one includes gardens with fresh vegetables and herbs, compost, additional tool storage, chickens, two car parking spaces, and a fire circle. Zones two to four include perennial ground cover that I've established since moving here. Um, foraging, exploration, and observation opportunities, wildlife habitat, sources of wood, wet, a wetland native plant food forest, and honeybee hives. In the future, I hope to add these existing resources, or additional resources, uh, rainwater catchment system, a wood stove, a clothesline, a larger expanded garden, a drift blocking fence, um, some bicycle parking space, community gathering space, a cob oven, 
an evaporator and a solar dehydrator. Um, and a purple martin habitat. Purple martins are a really cool local bird. They actually eat mosquitoes uh, during the day. Um, amazing bird. They live in these little gourd houses. In zones two to four, I would like to add sheep for their wool, manure, and mowing capabilities. Mowing is my least favorite chore. Um, I'd also like to add a small fruits orchard containing native grapes and berries. And a larger orchard slash food forest filled with native nuts and fruits and possibly a high tunnel if I can get that funded. As you can see here, the land provides almost every imaginable microclimate, which is wonderful because biodiversity is very high on this site. Um, we see myriad birds, land animals, insects on the land, many that I had never seen before I lived here. Um, and their numbers seem to be increasing every year, which is wonderful. As a farmer and an inhabitant of a wetland in a riparian floodplain, water is my constant teacher. We have floods like the one shown on this slide about four times a year. After two to three days of, since the beginning of a flood like this, the creek that overflows into the fields, the creek recedes back onto itself into its normal shape. But when we first moved in, um, we were seeing the water remain in our field for several weeks following every flood event. Now, the water, after a couple of weeks, the water would begin to smell unhealthy and mosquitoes would breed and we were dealing with huge swarms of mosquitoes foul odors, something about it just did not seem healthy or good to us. Um, so the land had all been used to grow commodity crops, mostly corn, um, on both sides of this road. And um, so we were very concerned about what the water was doing and we certainly didn't enjoy the mosquitoes. So my first thought was, to build some kind of earthwork to remedy this problem. But thankfully, before I started digging, I called my Natural Resource Conservation Service office for advice. And this was a really amazing move because they sent out two representatives for free to walk the land with me and offer context and advice. And when I asked them about drainage tiles or detention ponds or berms, um, they asked me to please not do anything like that. <laughs> so they said, this land is a natural wetland and most similar places have already been drained and destroyed to make room for agriculture. So wetlands serve very important ecological functions and it would really be best not to destroy any more of them which made a lot of sense to me. But what I said to these guys was, I really wanna grow trees, especially fruit bearing trees and nut bearing trees. And are there any trees that would even grow in a place like this? And they just kind of smiled at me and giggled and they said, oh yes, there are. So it turns out, even though I was raised like many people to believe that Flooding is a sign of something really gone wrong. As it turns out, wetlands are not wastelands. They are vibrant ecosystems that perform vital ecological functions. And so my NRCS representative and I, we came up with this plan together where he provided me with some financial support through that department. And um, he provided me a list of native tree species that would likely thrive in exactly this type of wetland environment. So I looked at his list and I selected from that list um, the species that I thought would provide good food and medicine. So at the same time as I've been planting all these trees from that list that we selected, um, I've allowed the land to lay fallow. So I have not been tilling in this land and I've allowed all the wild plants that came and established themselves to stay. So 
when the land was um, planted in corn, the soil was mostly bare most of the time. And it was very vulnerable to erosion. And the soil surface had crusted over and it was very difficult for the water to percolate down into the soil after a flooding event. But now the influx of plant roots has already improved our lives immensely because it totally protects the surface of the soil from further erosion. And the roots of the soil open all these drainage channels down into the ground. So when we have a flooding event, um, the water percolates down in a matter of days rather than weeks. In addition to that, the trees that we've planted are little by little expanding their root systems. And as their roots grow deeper and deeper, then that facilitates even faster drainage of the floodwaters because the roots will soak up a lot of that water and be really, really thirsty. So we're even only four years into that project, we're seeing huge changes. And rather than weeks and weeks of stagnant water and huge swarms of mosquitoes, we're now seeing a pretty manageable amount of mosquitoes in only three to four days of standing water. Now, the picture above shows the land about a month after a flood. And you can see my land on the left is completely drained. That's a several years into a restoration project. The land on the, on the right side of the street, it's also in the midst of a restoration project, but it's much newer. So that land hasn't really had time to recover. And you can see there's still some water on that side, but we think it'll get better and better as time goes by. Luckily, the house is built on high ground and has no flooding issues. This view shows our house and backyard. And this small section will contain the densest cluster of components because it's such a huge part of our lives. So the existing back patio, which is somewhat problematic and not very useful right now, will be removed in favor of a Mediterranean garden. Then a new larger patio will be built further into the backyard where community events can take place and a clothesline and a purple marten habitat will be erected, um, sharing some of the same posts for multi-use functionality. Fun and useful appropriate technologies will be included, um, such as a cob oven, a wood-fired evaporator slash grill and a solar dehydrator. These all can serve dual purposes as allowing me to process my harvest from the farm and also serving as teaching tools for community engagement and gatherings. This part of the garden shown here is already established and contains 12 raised beds, two herb spirals, a compost system, and three chicken aviaries. This is the future view showing the native grape and berry vineyard that don't exist yet. Um, the existing woodland and the future to be expanded market garden. The garden expansion will be surrounded by a six foot privacy fence atop a gravel and sand trench. I believe this combination will be effective to block most of the herbicide drift and runoff that currently affects my part of the land. I will um, also dig a small pond in the middle of this field and surround it with a small sandy beach. This will allow me to experiment with certain native water loving crops such as the American lotus, as well as some nearby sandy habitat natives like the prickly pear cactus. And also will provide a reflect refreshing place to cool down during long summer work days. Toward the back side of the garden, I will build a moon garden lounge area to encourage myself and others to meander all the way through the garden. The moon garden will include a patio and a fire rink. I also hope to construct a wallapini along the south side of this field as well, but I'm unsure if the water table is low enough to allow it. The woods will all remain intact, but I am working to reduce the invasive species such as bush honeysuckle to make room for beneficial native herbs, many of which are threatened or endangered due to habitat loss. I also intend to cultivate mushrooms in the damp shade of these woods. 
This field is on its way to becoming an upland native plant food forest slash orchard. I have already planted dozens of pawpaw and persimmon trees in this field and chestnuts and other species are soon to join them. I've tried and failed to establish a privacy hedge of Norway spruce around this field due to the herbicide drift, but I want to try again to establish a living, living hedge with the white pine because I have read that white pine is a little bit more tolerant to the herbicide drift than spruce is. I'm also told that it might be possible for me to receive funding assistance to build a high tunnel. Now, if I can get that funding assistance, I would like to build it along the edge of this field, which will further help me to block herbicide drift. This view shows the wetland food forest that I have already planted. It is planted in a modified guild system, which I reimagined on an easy to manage grid layout. So the canopy trees are planted on a 25 foot grid with rows of understory trees at 10 foot spacing between each 25 foot row. Within each 25 row containing canopy trees, there's an understory tree planted midway between each canopy tree. So the spacing is 12 and a half feet in those rows. Then we have wild strips containing grasses and wild flowers that grow between each row of trees. When the trees grow larger, they'll shade out some of these grasses and some of these flowers, but it will make room for new plants to join the habitat. Since I've spent so many years overworked and overstressed trying to pursue my passions during nights and weekends while most of my time was spent commuting and earning money another way, I now place a very high priority on my mental and, and emotional health and healing. My economic needs are partially provided for by my past life as a super frugal software engineer, um, saving and investing as much of my income as possible. And the rest of my needs are met by producing, making, repairing, and foraging most of my material needs, and also by selling my art and my surplus farm harvests. I hope that some additional income may come eventually from writing and teaching. Although I live in a rural area, five miles from the nearest town, I am able to use an electric assisted bicycle for most of my transportation needs. Um, I do have an old hybrid car that I can use when I need it, um, but someday I hope to build a bicycle trailer that will further reduce my reliance on the car. There's also a photovoltaic system that my husband designed, which fully powers our house, as well as my bicycle and our well pump. As for the built environment, I am a part of the eco bricking movement, and I've personally made over 100 eco bricks. Um, an eco brick, it's basically a plastic bottle that is tightly packed with soft plastic wrappers and stuff until it's so hard that you can use it as a, a building supply like a brick. So I've been collecting these bricks in hopes of um, building a little shed for my tool storage. And after I've done that one project um, and you know learned how it all works, I really want to reach out further into the community and see if we can maybe do some community group projects. This chart shows the links between all the components on the farm, present and future. For example, the chickens provide pest control, garden tillage, cleanup and fertilizer to the orchards, vineyards and vegetable gardens. They also provide beautiful feathers for jewelry and art projects, which they shed naturally once per year. All chickens can provide these services, by the way, even the roosters. So I have all my roosters still, I didn't uh, get rid of them. Uh, the hens also provide us with eggs as an extra bonus. In exchange, the farmer, that's me, uh, provides food, shelter, and care to the chickens. But without the chickens, I would work even harder to accomplish all the work the chickens are doing. So um, I'm personally a longtime vegetarian. And when I began gardening, 
organic gardening, I felt like I did not want to buy feather meal and blood meal and manure from the slaughterhouse industry. So I did some research and I discovered this thing called veganic growing. But the thing is that all of the fertilizers used in veganic growing are basically the ingredients in chicken feed. So <laughs> once I moved onto this large piece of land and I could have chickens, I immediately saw the benefit of it and I got them as soon as I could. Um, it's basically, you get multiple uses out of the fertilizer. First, they eat the fertilizer and then you, know, you get all of their hard work and services um, in addition to the manure, which then is still the fertilizer. So um, that's a really good system and I do it in a very um, humane way a good relationship with the chickens. This project began five years ago. So that's phase zero acknowledges what has already been completed. We have already planted a food forest covering 2.4 acres of riparian floodplain land, have already built three chicken coops and raised a healthy flock of chickens and figured out how to keep all of the roosters. I have already built two top bar beehives and kept bees for two years. The bees actually absconded, but I'm going to get more. Um, I have built 13 raised garden beds and two herb spirals and prepared a 20 by 30 in-ground vegetable garden with drip irrigation. I have, or my husband, installed a whole house photo photovoltaic system and um, I have replaced all of the halogen lights and incandescent lights in the house with LEDs and insulated all the doors and windows. I've also replaced all the water fixtures with low flow aerators, planted a wild garden along the edge of the woods of nettles and spikenard. I have begun planting the upland orchard with 30 persimmon trees and 50 pawpaw trees. Have also built an indoor seedling nursery with a capacity of 15 trays and an indoor energy-free microgreens nursery, which holds 30 loaf pans. I've also planted a perennial ground cover over all the land to build soil health and prevent further erosion. Phase one is happening now through projected 2022. The goals for phase one include becoming a vendor at the local farmer's market, growing an abundance of birdhouse gourds to begin the purple marten habitat, um, installing three tall posts in the backyard and using them to install a clothesline and some other things, um, building the privacy fence to block a drift, planting the orchard, begin expanding the garden, and continue with clearing the poison ivy and bush honeysuckle and reclaiming the woods for some native plants. Phase two, which will take place projected 2023 through 2025, remove the current patio and we replace it with a heat loving garden, um, complete training as an herbalist and a naturalist, begin the new gathering space patio, begin preparing the vineyard, um, plant the vineyard, um, all those things. Um, and then for phase three, this project is not a five-year project or a 10-year project. This is a lifelong project. And I expect this to be my life's work. So after phases one and two are complete, um, as the work continues over many, many years, um, I will begin to host community events at the farm. And I really hope that this farm will serve as an educational and demonstration space where other people can learn about wetland ecosystems, about permaculture, and about native plants and their uses. Um, I also plan to continue to write about these topics on my blog, and I also would like to write some books. Um, sheep will come onto the farm when it's the right time for them, when the trees are strong enough not to be damaged by their grazing. And I also would like to work within the community to build native food forests in public spaces where everyone can enjoy them. My current maintenance plan year round, I care for the chickens. 
Spring is the time when I plant new trees and plant the garden. Um, there's also beehive maintenance that happens in the spring. Throughout the summer, I harvest produce. I do food processing and preservation for the winter and market sales. Um, I also mow monthly around the young trees. You can see that in the photo there. Um, that allows them to have airflow and um, sunshine, even though they're still very small. That won't have to continue once they grow bigger. Uh, in autumn, I harvest fruits and nuts, and I also forage a lot of nuts and acorns and other edibles from public spaces or from Queens yards. Um, and I also, additional beehive maintenance happens in autumn, have to prepare the hives for winter. And then during winter, I spend that time um, just doing general maintenance that's kind of needs to be happen, but hap needs to happen, but is a little bit lower priority, like pruning and mulching and cleaning up the woodland, moving the chicken coops, um, I also start seeds for the spring garden in late winter, and winter is also a great time to pursue continuing education like this um, permaculture design certificate program. Here is my species list. Now note that all of these species are native plants. So recently in a local permaculture forum that I'm a part of, somebody posted a question asking for recommendations of native plants for their gardens. And another permaculturist responded back to that person and said, hey, we're permaculturists. We don't do native plants. We only do useful plants. And you can see here though, that there are so many useful native plants and the native plants also provide so many other benefits to the local ecosystem by supporting birds and pollinators and all these insects that are locally adapted to very specific plants. So you really don't have to choose one or the other. You can maybe have both. So um, another great thing about the native plants is that once they get established, they don't require any irrigation and they require very little maintenance. So even though I'm kind of managing this pretty large tract of land by myself, it's not so bad because it's not like having 10 acres of apple trees that need intensive sprays and so much pruning and, and irrigation and fertilizing. These plants grow in the woods by themselves with nobody caring for them. So I really just have to manage the chaos and, um, and harvest. This is a listing of the components um, I have and plan to have. And most of these I've already touched on in the other slides. My biggest stakeholder by far is my husband, Andrew. In our stakeholder interview, he requested that we always make space for beautiful flowers, especially marigolds, those are his favorite. And he requested that the home and the land always be well suited to entertaining friends, family, community, and cats big cat lover. Um, he's not a farmer himself, but is very supportive of my goals and my work with the land. He would also love to have a peach tree and he loves technology and he designed our home photovoltaic system himself. I've been observing, learning and co-evolving with this land since I moved here in 2015. In the early days before the fields were planted with perennial cover, Flood water stagnated for four to six weeks following every flood event. Now the water drain in four to six days with no earthworks, only plants. In years with prolific mulberry crops, I've noticed that the birds leave some of the blackberries for me. But last year, the mulberries all got frosted out and we had a terrible mulberry crop and I didn't get to eat any blackberries. So I think uh, there's a good, good argument to keep the mulberries even though they're not really native here. Um, also last year, a giant swallowtail butterfly laid eggs on my tiny little potted lemon tree. Um, I did a little research and discovered that she was probably looking for a shrub called prickly ash, uh, which was once common to this area. Um, although I have lived here most of my life, I've never seen one of these prickly ash trees or shrubs, it's a kind of a smallish tree. Uh, and it's not related to the ash tree either, just a common name. 
but I've been looking all over trying to find seeds or plants to get some prickly ash established on the land and I'm hopeful to do that next year. As for personal boundaries, um, I'm really just trying to grow really slowly and feel everything out before making each move. Um, I, I really, like I said before, I've been through um, a lot of struggles to get here and I'm kind of tired and I'm kind of restoring right now. So I'm gonna make sure that I have always time for a full night's sleep, time to do yoga and make music as I feel called to do and um, make sure that every year I set a budget and work within it. My resources are so many to name, so many abundant resources on this land. The land itself is an amazing gift. I feel so blessed to be able to have such a sizable piece of land. Um, I also have ample water to work with as I'm sure you've seen through these slides. Um, we have ample wood energy and sun energy that we're able to use, ample wild food, fresh eggs, feathers and vegetables coming from the garden. Um, contentedness and a resilient mindset serve me well. I also have true friends and loved ones who provide joy and support and are so, so such a blessing to me. Um, and financial stability, which is the legacy of my 14 year career in software engineering. In the larger community, I especially value resources that my neighbors provide the county extension office and the NRCS office all offer so much knowledge and guidance. And I liberally use um, the chip drop service, which provides free tree chip mulch from arbor arborists. And my public library is such a lifesaver. So thank you so much for listening and for the wonderful content in the Permaculture Women's Guild Permaculture Design Certificate course. Um, it's given me so many new ideas and renewed enthusiasm for this work. And it's also added valuable context and perspective. I'm so grateful for the opportunity to study this program and to do this work. And I thank you all. <laughs>